Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome back to the Gray Zone. It's Friday night, uh, really momentous week, and a whole lot ahead. I don't know. We're in World War III. We've been in World War III, so maybe World War IV is about to start. Uh, we're live on Rockfin now. I'm here with award-winning Canadian journalist Aaron Mate. Aaron, how's it going? How's it going, Max? How's it going, everybody? Thanks for joining us. If you're watching this live, please like the stream so we can beat the inevitable algorithmic suppression. It, we have so much to talk about today. There's so much going on. Um, Biden all of a sudden expanding the war zone to Yemen uh, with these strikes on um, multiple areas targeting Ansar Allah, a.k.a. AKA the Houthis. And you also have this historic ICJ hearing, which I know, Max, you, you've, you have a lot to say. Um, well, we do both. Anybody should have a lot to say. But yeah, we'll break down. We'll break down some key pieces there. And we, of course, have an update on the saga of these allegations put out by Israel and its supporters, including The New York Times, of a systemic pattern of sexual violence by Hamas on October 7th, a story that continues to collapse. And uh, you put out, Max, a piece this week on the gray zone, which detailed in exhaustive fashion the glaring problems with the New York Times story. I helped you out a little bit, and you were generous enough to give me a co-byline, but that this really was your work. And it's an incredible piece of journalism. And we're going to talk about that, too as well as another uh, great act of journalism you did, which was confronting the State Department directly about the ICJ genocide hearing, including and asking them point blank whether Tony Blinken is personally concerned about his complicity and his potential exposure to the same charges that, that South Africa wants to bring against Israel, uh, against Israel. Well, thank you for saying that. I actually think, uh, I'm actually still putting together some elements for this stream as we speak, but I actually think that, um, it would be great if we got to that, but this story at, in, in uh, Ynet, Yedio Daranot, by none other than Ronan Bergman is at least as significant, and we should cover that first because we were supposed and not, not first in, in in the stream. I think we should should do Yemen and the ICJ, but um, before we even get back to the New York Times and this Hamas mass rape propaganda. Um, we were attacked and called conspiracists for raising questions about friendly fire deaths on October 7th. And of course, the Washington Post was preparing a hit piece. And then, bam, the most popular paper in Israel with, a, with its national security correspondent, Ronan Bergman, who also is a contributor and editor at the New York Times, drops this piece about Hannibal Directive orders from the top uh more evidence to support what we've been saying almost from the beginning so we'll get to that as well um i think we should start with icj because you know while yemen is really dominating the news cycle right now we shouldn't get distracted from the importance of this case and whether it's intentionally or not uh whether intentionally or not it has distracted from it, and that's unfortunate. It kind of reminds me almost of when uh, the Palestine Papers came out back in, I believe, 2011, showing the Palestinian Authority offering Israel, almost begging Israel to take, in the words of the PA's negotiator, um, Saib Arakat, like a negotiator for life, the yard, largest Yerushalayim in history, and this devastating expose of or leak of documents exposing the PA, the Arab Spring just started like that day, the so-called mm. Arab Spring. Mm. And it just wiped that away from the news cycle. So I don't want things to get lost. Mm. Um, what did you think, first of all? I, I don't know if you watched Israel's defense today, but what did you think of South Africa's presentation? Well, it was moving, you know, first of all, this historic victim of apartheid, uh, coming forward to defend another victim of apartheid and the added symbolism of the fact that during the apartheid era in South Africa, Israel and the U.S. were basically among its top foreign allies. Um, the U.S. you know, claimed to follow the arms embargo on South Africa, but never really followed it. And when they really wanted to get around it, they could rely on Israel to sell South Africa 
uh, weapons and even try to give it uh, nuclear secrets. And so the fact that South Africa liberated itself from apartheid, despite the best efforts of Israel and the U.S., and then can now bring a case against Israel, charging it with genocide against the apartheid colony that it rules over, uh, the occupied territories, that was very moving. And South Africa, you know, they don't have any interest in doing this. They don't gain anything from this except for global support from people with no power. But it's not as if the people of Palestine can offer South Africa anything. So that was just, it was amazing to see a state act selflessly and present such a meticulous case. They obviously really, really prepared for it and put it forward of, you know, I, I think an irrefutable argument um, and did so really respectfully. They went out of their way to not try to, uh, you know, appeal to people emotionally by showing videos of all the horror in Gaza just by presenting the cold, hard facts, including the genocidal statements of so many Israeli officials. Yeah. The intent to commit genocide is always the most difficult thing to prove in any genocide case. And here, I think we have historically the most plentiful evidence in history, partly because of the advanced state of technology, social media, and the prom promiscuity of Israeli soldiers in Gaza in broadcasting their war crimes. Uh, an extremely parochial national group that speaks a language that few people in the world speak who thinks that they're only speaking to one another, uh, broadcasting their war crimes to the world, not realizing other people can translate what they say and view them blowing up homes in, a, uh, in honor of their daughter's second birthday as actually disgusting and not something to be proud of. Uh, and so these figured prominently along with the statements of Israeli leadership in South Africa's presentation, as I predicted, the night before, or the yeah, the night before South Africa presented its case that Israel has the potential to commit genocide, the word Amalek, the term Amalek, the biblical term Amalek, which we'll talk about in a second, would figure at the heart of its presentation. Uh, this is uh, South Africa's Tembeka Naguka Tobi. Hopefully I got that somewhat right. Who is a 47-year-old lawyer from South Africa laying out the case. There is an extraordinary feature in this case that Israel's political leaders, military commanders, and persons holding official positions have systematically and in explicit terms declared their genocidal intent. And these statements are then repeated by soldiers on the ground in Gaza as they engage in the destruction of Palestinians and the physical infrastructure of Gaza. Israel's special genocidal intent is rooted in the belief that in fact the enemy is not just the military wing of Hamas or indeed Hamas generally, but is embedded in the fabric of Palestinian life in Gaza. There is an extraordinary... Definitely. And that was really a central theme in my video, which you can find on our YouTube channel, What's Wrong with Israelis? Where Israelis are just using Hamas and interchangeably with Palestinians, all Palestinians. And re referring to Palestinians as a sort of comprehensively evil entity that needs to be eradicated and mocking them then for being eradicated, mocking them for not having electricity, mocking them in social media videos for not having water, uh, reveling in mass destruction. Um, the expressions of genocidal intent are so abundant by Israeli leaders that in the 20 minutes that South Africa had to focus on genocidal intent, there just simply wasn't enough time. But I think one of the most powerful documents was this video um, that the South African legal team presented here of the Golani Brigade chanting that our slogan is that there is no uninvolved in Gaza. Clear genocidal intent. There are no civilians in Gaza and that they will wipe out the seed of Amalek. December 2023, Israeli soldiers proved 
that they understood the Prime Minister, Minister's message to remember what the Amalek has done to you as genocider. They were recorded by journalists dancing and singing. We know our motto, there are no uninvolved, that they obey one commandment, to wipe off the seed of Amalek. The Prime Minister's invocation of Amalek is being used by soldiers to justify the killing of civilians, including children. These are the soldiers repeating the inciting words of their Prime Minister. I'm coming to Gaza to beat Hamas and Hezbollah. I stick by one mitzvah to wipe off the seed of, to wipe out the seed of Amalek. These are Golani Brigade soldiers on their way into northern Gaza, where they've been responsible for seemingly countless field executions, bursting into families' homes and killing them, killing people, waving white flags. I left home behind me. Won't come back until victory. We know our slogan. There are no uninvolved civilians. And I mean, that's been proven in the time that it pretty much took between South Africa's presentation and Israel's. Uh, Israel attacked a ambulance crew killing four Palestinian medics. It attacked several civilian homes. And we saw, you know, even when with Israeli civilians, sorry, Israeli hostages attempting to wave white flags with their shirts off, running towards Israeli soldiers, begging them to rescue them in Shujaia. Those soldiers had shoot to kill orders for everything that moved yeah. and they gunned them down, two of them, and then chased the other one and killed him execution style. So proving that their slogan is there are no uninvolved civilians. So that was a particularly powerful piece of evidence. Yeah. And as we're speaking too, we have to mention that there's another um, power outage at the Al-Aqsa Martyrs Hospital in central Gaza because of a lack of fuel, because of Israel's cut off the fuel. And uh, this has put many patients in the ICU um, at risk, uh, as Israel has done in hospitals across Gaza. And just to underscore the point about Amalek, I mean, it's not just soldiers who are chanting this. You can draw a direct line between those, between that video footage of those soldiers talking about going to Gaza and uh, wiping out Amalek and Benjamin Netanyahu, who was the first person to reference Amalek, and, uh, which is a biblical reference to um, wiping out an enemy people. Um, and so that's just one of countless examples that South Africa invoked to make the point that Israel has genocidal intent, as they've openly made clear. And I can't even think of an example of an Israeli official or leader who's gone out of their way to try to claim as if that their issue is not with the people of Gaza, it's with Hamas. So many people like Isaac Herzog, the president, have all said they're all complicit. They're all guilty of being in Hamas. Uh, there, there's no distinction. So uh, Israel just, like they. I don't even think that, Nazis were so openly genocidal. Um, well, in their intent, I'm not going to minimize anything they did. It's just the evidence here is so plentiful because of the proliferation of social media and the pride of in which Israel, Israeli common civilians serving as reservists and leadership broadcast their intention to commit genocide and their war crimes. There, you saw Al Aqsa Hospital, the lights had been turned off, lack of fuel. Hospitals are at a state of total collapse. They're barely limping along. They're treating people uh, with uh, sometimes with just aspirin or IVs when they're coming in with uh, you know injuries to their limbs from Israeli explosives. And uh, another piece of evidence South Africa presented was the Defense Minister Yoav Gallant declaring in turning off the no declaring no water, no fuel, no electricity that the population of Gaza consists of human animals. Now, remember in the book of Deuteronomy, when Netanyahu makes this reference to Amalek, which he has repeatedly made throughout his career, which carries enormous resonance, particularly within the religious national camp, which is incipient within Israeli society and politics, that Amalek disguised itself, the tribe of Amalek would disguise itself as animals which required God to also slaughter all the livestock. Uh, 
this is just an ex it, it's such a a dog whistle or air horn if you want to call it that for killing everything including the animals including the babies the the people of Amalek snuck up on the Hebrews as they were trying to escape from Israel which is also you know a the, they're invoked to reference October 6th and the sneak attack and everyone's guilty as soon as you say that word you're calling for genocide Netanyahu is also referred to Iranians as Amalek. So I don't know. I, I, I thought it was a really strong case just because basically they put forward what we have been put, putting forward on our live stream and what everyone has been seeing and what Israeli leaders and, and so, soldiers and reservists want people to see. Uh, it's kind of, we don't know how they're going to rule. We'll talk about, you know, the judges on the court and so on. Israel's strategy, I think, is actually more interesting to discuss than South Africa's presentation, um, just because of its sheer cynicism. But when, however they rule, however the International Court of Justice rules, and I think there's a chance they could just be so compromised that they'll rule against South Africa. South Africa's already achieved a victory of sorts in frightening Israeli leadership, intimidating them for the first time or putting them on notice, they've noticeably changed their rhetoric since this case was brought forward. We'll see if Israeli soldiers keep uh, flaunting their war crimes. But Netanyahu is running around claiming, oh, we're not going to displace anyone and people, uh, there's, no, there's no voluntary immigration. Um, I mean, you can just see a perceptible shift. Isaac Herzog is out there saying we follow the laws of war and we're the most moral army. That to me is demonstrates the power of this case. Yeah, well, listen, um, on the issue of the ICJ and their impartiality, uh, two members of the court are worth noting. Joan Donahue is yep. the, I believe she's the head. She, she, she's the current president of the ICJ. And who is she? She's a veteran U.S. legal official, served in the State Department, and she was an advisor for the Reagan administration when Nicaragua took the U.S. to the ICJ in the 1980s for terrorism, for mining Nicaragua's harbor uh, as part of uh, the U.S. attempt to destroy the Sandinista movement in Nicaragua. So the head of the ICJ is a former U.S. advisor in a case where the U.S. ultimately lost uh, on uh, and was basically uh, found guilty of state terrorism in the case of Nicaragua. So that, that's Joan Donahue. And then you have Aharon Barak, who's an Israeli, um, and he's known as a liberal inside Israel. But when it comes to Palestinians, he's a you know he's an extreme hawk. Um, he's even ruled, I believe, to legalize torture and hostage taking uh, against Palestinians. Yeah. Aharon Barak's involvement as the Israeli IC judge on this case is so significant because it shows how the liberal Zionist camp, which was out there protesting against Netanyahu until October 7th, has always closed ranks with the most extreme right-wing factions during any time of national crisis because at the end of the day, they're liberal with their Zionism. And Aharon Barak is the living symbol of liberal Zionism. He's also an icon to many American liberals, he was a mentor to Elena Kagan, the Supreme Court Justice, and is famous for writing Israel's basic laws, which are a stand-in for Israel's constitution. If you closely examine the basic laws, while they seem to enshrine some kind of rights for all Israeli citizens, including the 1.5 or 1.8 million Palestinian citizens, they also consolidate Israel's Jewish supremacist character explicitly. They declare that Israel is a officially Jewish state. So whenever anyone asks the Palestinians or anyone else to recognize Israel's existence, they're asking them to recognize the Jewish supremacist existence consolidated by Aharon Barak, who also was a protector of the occupation of Palestinians. He refused to rule against home demolitions as a form of collective punishment against Palestinians accused of carrying out acts of resistance against the occupation, including armed resistance, uh, which is a total violation of international law. And his successors also refused to rule against apartheid highways like Highway 443, in which 
uh, Palestinians who possessed the Hoia, the, you know, the, the PA green identity card were forbidden from driving. So this is the, the liberal legacy. The legacy of liberal Zionism is clear now. It's to protect the Zionist project of genocide. And that's why he's on the court. There's no, and there's absolutely no way in hell that he is going to rule in support of South Africa. And then you have all the European jurists. You see that Germany, the author of the Holocaust in the 20th, 20th century, has joined unusually as a third party to support Israel after all it was done. Yeah. And, you know, you know, just, you know, just pausing for a second and thinking of this historically, it's pretty it's just, you know, understanding what the what the Jewish people went through and the Nazi Holocaust <laughs> to fast forward to now. Um, 80 years later, and now the Jewish state is accused of genocide. Uh, there's just there's something historically so tragic about that. A people that suffer genocide go on to perpetrate it. You know, uh, it's such a um, it's such a profound injustice, obviously, and it's such a disrespect to the memory of of the Jewish Holocaust. And you know, the fact that they're uh, the people that fought the the Jewish state that soon followed went on to uh, carry out the same crime. There's just something to reenact it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's sort of, you know, you witnessed Israel's, the Golani Brigade in Gaza. It looks like an Einsatz group in reenactment society. Yeah. Yeah. With what they're doing, the humiliation, the sheer delight in humiliating people and destroying yeah. the basis of life there. Yeah. Uh, the, the, the joy that they show in killing. And, uh, you know, another, another, I mean, there's a dispute or a debate on whether Germans actually were fully aware in Germany of what was taking place in their midst. Many yep. of the worst death camps, Auschwitz, for example, were in Poland outside of Germany. Uh, so when the allies liberated Buchenwald, one of the first things they did was gather the Germans, the good upstanding Germans who were uh, in nearby in the town and parade them through the camp and force them to look at what was taking place in their midst. Yep. Israelis, Jewish Israelis, well, Israelis, all, they know exactly what's going on. Yes. They don't know maybe what Gaza, people in Gaza are going through, but they know exactly what their army's doing. And they're yeah. delighting in it because these are TikTok videos and social media videos and speeches that are for them in Hebrew. Yep. If you were a German back then, you could plausibly claim you didn't know. And if you said that, it would be plausible. There, there are many ways in which that could be true. Now, though, if you're Israeli, you're an American who supports this, you have no excuse. You have absolutely none. They know exactly what's going on, but they choose to support it. And they're involved. Uh, they're involved in a very intimate way. The Israeli reservists have been, who've been mobilized, they just keep mobilizing more and more people from the rank and file of Israeli society to participate in this genocide. So the Israeli defense today, I don't know if you got to watch any of it, um, but, uh, you know, it was led by Malcolm Shaw who had several Robert Mueller moments. I mean, he was touted by Israel as this eminent British jurist. I don't know if he was paid or what, who played an important role in writing international law. Um, and I, I will, yeah, go ahead. Well, here's the first uh, clip we have of of Malcolm Shaw. I know that you had some thoughts on it. Yeah. The immediate and proximate context for the specific allegations of genocide claimed by South Africa lies in the event <laughs> the 7th of October, when Hamas militants and other armed groups of individuals stormed into the internationally recognized sovereign territory of Israel and committed acts of barely credible atrocity. It was these events that truly constitute the real context for South Africa's allegations. Indeed, such acts may be seen as the real genocide in this situation. As the president of the European Commission put it on the 19th of October, 
there was no limit to the blood Hamas terrorists wanted to spill. They went home by home. They burned people alive. They mutilated children and even babies. Why? Because they were Jews. Because they were living in the state of Israel. And Hamas's explicit goal is to eradicate Jewish life from the Holy Land. These terrorists, supported by their friends in Tehran, will never stop. And so Israel has the right to defend itself in line with humanitarian law. So many false statements in that short little clip. Um, repeating the claim about babies. They mutilated babies. They burned people alive. Um, is there any evidence of that? Well, that was a statement by EU Commission President Ursula von der Leyen, who it was a former, I think, former German defense minister. You know, she comes from Germany. So she comes from the country that was, is the third party supporting Israel's defense, a country which supports Israel more than many Israelis even do. Not exactly an objective witness here. She made this de declaration at the Hudson Institute in the United States, a neoconservative arm industry sponsored think tank. And this was on October 19th, right after October 7th, um, when Israel's propaganda campaign was still in full swing, high dudgeon, and very few people were actually correcting the facts. So she says, many babies were killed. They killed babies. That's false. We know it's false. It's totally false. I want that guy to come in and be like, you know, from the, the 90s show, completely untrue. Never happened. Because only one baby was killed, one baby too many, but only one baby was killed on October 7th. Myla Cohen, 10 months old, accidentally shot in Kibbutz Berry. No children were mutilated by Hamas. There's no evidence of that. We've been through this before. Tony Blinken put this forward a few days later at Senate Foreign Relations Committee claiming that uh, uh, Hamas commandos mutilated children in front of their parents and then had lunch in the next room. That was a tall tale spun out by the known fabulous Yossi Landau of Zaka. So basically, Malcolm Shaw, this is right at the beginning of Malcolm Shaw's presentation. This is his first exhibit. This is the first exhibit in Israel's whole defense. And he's saying this quote by Ursula von der Leyen demonstrates that in fact, this whole trial should be about Hamas committing genocide and not about what Israel's done. And it's a false statement on its face, along with a lot of rhetoric about, oh, they did it just because they're Jews, um, which is, you know, many Jews, including myself, have passed through Gaza. I didn't have any problem with them there. It seems to be that their problem is with their occupier. We don't even need to debate that. It's just empty, empty propagandistic rhetoric. So that was just out of the gate, a gigantic falsehood. Yeah. And Hamas's goal also is not to eradicate Jewish life from the Holy Land. Uh, their goal is, is liberation of Palestine. They've changed their charter. They changed it in 2017. Uh, they said their problem is not with the Jews. It's with the Israeli state that uh, claims to speak on behalf of the Jewish people that has colonized their land. Um, whatever you think of their tactics, they're a liberation movement. And uh, so it's just, it's that, that, that allegation of uh, uh, Hamas seeking to eradicate Jewish life is projection because it's Israelis who openly proclaim that their goal is Jewish sovereignty over all of Palestine. That's in Likud's founding charter, Jewish sovereignty from the river to the sea. Um, that's in Netanyahu's government's policy, that the Israeli government basically lays claim to all of Eretz Israel, which um, they might even, in, in their definition, they might even include Lebanon in that definition, because some, some, some of these Zionists do. So that allegation there from Malcolm Shaw is also an act of projection. Yeah, I mean, Israel tried to occupy Lebanon up to, and, and, and take it up to the Litani River, because they needed the water, yeah. the source of fresh water. They failed only because of Hezbollah. Hezbollah wouldn't have existed if they hadn't tried to do that. Yeah. So let's take a look at more of Malcolm Shaw's presentation. Almost doesn't require a rebuttal from us, but it's it's worth seeing what Israel's putting forward. Um, oh, and we'll, we'll 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 get into that. By Israel's robust and independent legal system. 
But that is not the intent to destroy all or part of a people as such. Israel's actions in restricting its targeting practices to attack military personnel or objectives in accordance with international humanitarian law in a proportionate manner in each case, as well as its practice of mitigating civilian harm, such as by forewarning civilians of impending action by the unprecedented and extensive use of telephone calls, leafleting, and so forth, coupled with the facilitation of humanitarian assistance, all demonstrate the precise opposite of any possible genocidal intent. So again, like things that didn't happen, just because you say something in a British accent with a wig on doesn't make it true. Okay. I mean, if he had, you know, if it was Jeff Foxworthy up there, it just wouldn't have worked, I guess. Um, but I mean, he's saying Israel makes meticulously makes phone calls to everyone to warn them to get away from the bombs that Israel only attacks military targets in a proportionate way. I mean, it just, and, and therefore it can't be genocide. And before that, he's saying that Israel actually has an independent judiciary, which punishes war criminals or those who commit war crimes. Have we ever seen anyone punished coming out of Gaza? since Operation Cast Lead, 2008, 2009, I can't think of anyone being punished. I mean, back in 2008, 2009, Israeli tank gunners shot up Sawari chicken farms in Gaza and killed like 15, 150,000 chickens just to destroy Gaza's agricultural economy. Was anyone punished for that? No, they just went to breaking the silence and says, I couldn't believe I had orders to shoot all these chickens. So everything yeah. he said, there was a lie. And what's funny is, um, doesn't Israel do these sort of performative cases to make it look as if they hold people to account for their conduct, soldiers to account for their conduct in the occupied territories? Like the most ridiculous cases to, to basically give the false appearance that they have a functioning legal system, that they don't tolerate crimes. But for example, wasn't there an Israeli soldier who was prosecuted for either stealing some money or stealing a credit card or something from Gaza? Like all these ben relatively benign crimes those are the ones that get punished by israel <laughs> to give the appearance that they actually hold people accountable and i suspect is that's done on purpose so they can argue before forums like the icj should this ever come up that look look no we have cases um like for example we punish soldier soldiers for stealing money or credit cards or, or whatever it is not for of course torturing killing people yeah this is back in 2009 <laughs> good memory i for forgot about this one Soldier who stole credit card during Gaza op jailed. <laughs> he got seven months in jail for stealing a credit card. Okay, Gaza's government has accused Israel of stealing $90,000 worth of gold. And there are photographs Israeli soldiers have taken of themselves stealing jewelry and gold from people's homes. <sighs> this guy used the card he stole during Operation Cast Lead to withdraw $400 and got this huge sentence um so yeah no one who like massacred children got sentenced though no so that was yeah token case did anyone get prosecuted for killing uh nine people and wounding dozens more on the mavi marmara in international waters uh the israeli special forces commando unit that just landed on the boat shot everyone up including a u.s citizen these were unarmed people, unarmed activists? Of course not. That was the mission. Uh, obstruct freedom of navigation in international waters. Yep. That's, that's, the, that's the siege. Yep. So uh, back to Malcolm Shaw. Let's see where I want to go next with this. Well, this is interesting. This is, this, I mean, this here really demonstrates uh, the fear that is starting to course through Israel's government because of this case. Completely outside the policy and decision-making process in the war. In any event, his statement was immediately repudiated by members of the war cabinet and other ministers, including the prime minister. So he's going through all of the statements expressing intent to commit genocide and explaining why <laughs> they were just a few bad apples. In tab 1A of the volume which Israel has submitted to the court, 
one may find numerous excerpts from internal cabinet decisions that attest to Israel's true intent throughout this war. Their true example, intent. For example, one finds the instructions from the Prime Minister in a meeting of the Ministerial Committee on National Security Affairs from the 29th of October, stating the following. One, the Prime Minister stated time and again, we must prevent a humanitarian disaster. Two, the Prime Minister indicated the possible sorts of solutions that may that will ensure required supply of water, food and medicine, increasing the amount of trucks entering with the necessary inspections. Three, promoting the construction of field hospitals in the south of the Gaza Strip. To re-emphasize, <laughs> this is a directive to authorities, nothing less. Tab 1A contains a considerable number of similar directives emphasizing the need to avoid harm to civilians and facilitate humanitarian aid. Okay, so you get the point. Um, so, I mean, either the Israeli government and military are, are the most incompetent in history, or they're just lying. They're just lying. Oh, they, they make, they, Netanyahu's specific instructions were to avoid a humanitarian catastrophe. And that's why we destroyed all the hospitals. And that's why we block aid trucks from entering Rafa. That's why we didn't even allow Karim Shalom where the trucks have to be screened from even opening until the U.S. put some token pressure. That's why, according to the U.N., according to UNICEF, 90% of Gaza is food insecure and is on the brink of famine. That's why... I mean, this this is this is wild. This is a new development. The wife of the biggest warmonger in pos in recent in Congress that I can remember, Cindy McCain, is calling for a ceasefire in Gaza because she happens to be the director of the World Food Program installed there because the U.S. has co-opted all these programs. We are looking at famine, according to John McCain's wife. The only way we can prevent this is by a ceasefire and safe unfettered access for our trucks and people. We've got to get in there. We have to. People are starving to death. Many of them are children. And we've documented this working with local Palestinian journalists at the Gray Zone, just interviewing people, showing the famine and the conditions they're facing. And according to Israel's defense team, Netanyahu instructed his people, his the, the Israeli military in Kogat, in charge of the siege of Gaza, to make sure this wasn't happening. Well, Cindy McCain just called you out. Cindy McCain, who was recently criticized by her own people for being uh, way too soft on this, for not calling for a ceasefire, and for even appearing at an event, a public event, at the Halifax Security Forum honoring Israel. Uh, <laughs> even Cindy McCain feels compelled to speak out. And this came out recently in the New York Times. This is a New York Times article uh, based on conversations with Israeli and U.S. sources. It said that uh, Netanyahu agreed to let humanitarian aid into Gaza as a condition for Biden visiting. So Netanyahu, initially, the policy was blocking humanitarian aid into Gaza. The only reason he actually allowed some token aid into Gaza, not even the full amount needed, but a token amount, is because that was a condition for Biden coming to visit him and bless his genocidal operation. So this idea that Israel's trying to get humanitarian aid in uh, is just such a complete joke, as Israeli and U.S. officials even privately admit. Complete joke, and everybody knows it. Uh, I, I wonder, are the judges buying it? I saw some of them falling asleep, which is <laughs> troubling. Uh, one more Malcolm Shaw low light. Manner and civilians should not be used for the purposes for the purpose of performing activities that might put them under risk to their mm. life or their body. Mm. This is a mandatory instruction effective since the start of the war. Tab wow. 1B contains many similar provisions, which are themselves only an illustration of many other such directives, orders, and procedures. Further on, the 28th of October, the Prime Minister publicly declared that the IDF is doing everything possible to avoid harming those not involved. While on the 18th of November, he declared that First of all, and above all else, Israel acts according to the laws of war. This is how our army works. 
I want to go back for a second. Just l- look at South Africa's team Orders and versus Israel's team. Just, just, just check out the well, vibe. On the 28th of October, the Prime Minister publicly declared that the IDF is doing everything possible to avoid harming those not involved. While on the 18th of November, he declared that, first of all, and above all, look at them, else, they're so nervous. It's like they have to wear diapers war. like the Israeli this soldiers in Shajaya. Our army works. <laughs> and the, the South African team is just completely stoic, completely chill. Um, and you know, these performances seem very jumpy by Israel. What he's saying there is that Israeli soldiers receive specific instructions not to humiliate civilians and not to deliberately place them in harm's way. Does that sound like reality? Uh, and does it seem like maybe they're not, if, if that was the, even the case, definitely ain't following those orders. I mean, everybody's seen this footage, this Nazi level Ugh. These are Palestinian men after having their homes destroyed, their families killed, taken out of shelters, stripped, and forced to issue Islamic prayers and against and denounce Hamas and Prime Minister Yahya Senwar under the penalty of being tortured, obviously. And pro-Israel accounts promote this. This is on the Mossad account, which is a private account supporting Israel's operation. They're proud of this. They actually think these guys are just doing this with zip ties on their hands out of the, in a sincere fashion, that they're denouncing Sinwar and Hamas in a sincere fashion. When we know that they are taken to a concentration camp south of Beersheba in Israel, handcuffed 24 hours a day, humiliated and tortured continuously, and that many have been beaten to death there. And we're supposed to believe Malcolm Shaw over our two lion eyes. That's what he's saying. I mean, so much footage like that. Anyone watching this has seen it. That's so... And again, I mean, South Africa didn't even have time to show all of this. There's one more uh, part of the presentation I wanted to show some of. I actually might not have it. Uh, for some reason, it's not loading. Um, so I'll just describe it briefly and we can move on. But Dr. Galit Rajuan, who is an Israeli jurist, also appeared after Malcolm Shaw and delivered a lengthy defense of destroying hospitals. I mean, this was pretty remarkable. My clip just won't load for me for whatever reason. And she actually brought up the footage and showed the footage of Israel of Israeli forces finding guns inside incubators. Like, why do you need to put guns in incubators if you're Hamas, for example? And they're little like Beretta guns. They're like the guns that like Bond girls hold in their pantyhose. By the way, the Beretta gun was frequently used in the past by Hamas, uh, by Mossad. Um, why, why would you put them in incubators? The only reason they'd be in incubators is because this propaganda stunt came out after Israel was exposed for leaving Palestinian infants alone in the ICU ward at a hospital that they had evacuated at, I believe, Rantisi Hospital, leaving them to die disconnected from their incubators. And so you're just trying to cover that up. Oh, the, the incubators were actually terror machines. So this the Israeli defense descends into a defense of destroying hospitals and taking kids off their incubators. If you can't see through this as a judge, then you are completely compromised. You are completely uh, or or completely ignorant. Aaron, we my bad for anyone who didn't catch the hearings. We don't want to create the impression that Israel was just trying to argue uh, the merits, that it claim, argue that it did not commit genocide. It also devoted a lot of energy to procedural grounds. Yeah. So, for, so for example, Shah, uh, Mal- Malcolm Shah, put a lot of uh, energy into this argument that South Africa didn't properly notify Israel right. that there was a conflict between the two states. So, like Israel was caught off guard. Like they thought basically we were like, like we thought that us and South Africa were friends and all of a sudden South Africa comes out of the blue 
there was some line from I think it was Shah where he says something like South Africa apparently believes it does not take two to tango as if like South Africa had blindsided Israel when meanwhile South Africa had openly said in international fora that Israel is committing genocide and I believe they even withdrew their ambassador <laughs> uh, to Israel in protest of its genocide in Gaza. right away. So, so this idea, this idea that like Israel was caught off guard by its friend South Africa, by the way, uh, whose friendship includes Israel trying to prop up the apartheid regime <laughs> back when it was exist, it just doesn't fly. It, it's a complete joke. But of course, they have to focus on these procedural uh, questions because they can't contest the issue at hand, which is genocide. Well, and then the other uh, tactic they pulled, basically what you got was just the, from all the familiar Hasbara tactics concealed behind a wig with a British accent. Um, here's a... Tal Becker, is that one? Tal Becker. Yeah. This is the other Israeli tactic. Hamas, 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 Hamas. And they all speak English. They're like native English speakers. So why do they have to sound like Ashkenazi Israelis every time they say Hamas? Hamas? <laughs> it's not Hamas. Like, why? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> also, it was so annoying when they call it the Hamas. The Hamas wants to kill us. If there are any provisional measures that should appropriately be indicated here, they are indeed with respect to South Africa. It's a matter of public record that South Africa enjoys close relations with Hamas, despite its formal recognition of a terrorist organization by numerous states across the world. These relations have continued unabated even after the October 7th atrocities. So basically, South Africa does not consider Hamas to be a terrorist organization like most of the global South. Therefore, their case is invalid. Yeah. Uh, any country that has relations with Cuba, which is pretty much most of the world, like over 90% of the world's population, would could uh, you could make the same argument because the U.S. has placed them on the state sponsored, the list of state sponsors of terrorism, just simply so it can justify the siege of Cuba. The reason that Hamas is considered a terrorist organization by all these Western nations is because Israel wants them to consider it such because they haven't been fully domesticated. They haven't put down their weapons and given up the struggle for nationhood just comes down to that. So that's a pretty weak argument and uh, it's a political argument, not a legal argument. I didn't see South Africa descend into a political arguments in the same way that Tal Becker just did. And by the way, I'm not sure Israel's ever apologized to the, to South Africa for supporting apartheid in South Africa. Uh, I'm pretty sure they haven't. Um, and uh, so this idea that like South Africa is the one that has that like is is compromised or you know has something to answer for with, with, between these two countries is just it's all the more of an insult given the actual history. Yeah, <laughs> I mean the history. It's not just that you know Israel gave some diplomatic support to apartheid South Africa. They had a, a, they were deeply invested in the survival of apartheid South Africa. They provided yeah. them with weapons in their fight against SWAPO. They provided them with walls and surveillance devices uh, to help segregate their black population. And they helped them get nuclear technology to acquire nuclear weapons through one of the Mossad's top assets who was working in Hollywood at Regent Studios, Arnon Milchan, Milchan hmm. working through with Shimon Perez. And Milchan was uh, the mentor of Yair Lapid, who was the last prime minister prior to Netanyahu. Um, so the, the relationship was extremely, extremely intimate. And while Nelson Mandela credited Cuba with helping liberate South Africa from the yoke of apartheid, he also directly pointed the finger at Israel for making it that much harder uh, to liberate themselves. It was Israel was holding on to the end even after the United States essentially gave up 
and like Republican Richard Luger of Indiana became the final vote to sanction apartheid South Africa. Israel was still holding on because they recognize once this country goes, we're next because the system of apartheid becomes that much more anachronistic in the world. And so Israel was first really accused of apartheid and systematic, a system of system, a system of racism uh, at the UN in 1972, there was the resolution to declare Zionism as racism. The UN didn't have some vote to decide that, oh, well, all of a sudden Zionism isn't racism. What happened was Israel and the PLO agreed to have the first peace process at a time of weakness for Palestinian resistance because the Soviet Union was collapsing. And so in order for Israel to go to Madrid, their condition was the UN drop that resolution. So the UN withdrew that resolution. That spirit, the spirit of that resolution was resurrected in Durban at the Conference Against Racism in, I believe, 2002. Yep. And this caused shockwaves uh, through Israel and the, is the international Israel lobby. Um, it was in South Africa where this movement was reborn and this gave life and energy to what would become the BDS movement, which was born as the result of an ICJ world court ruling against Israel's apartheid wall. So Israel builds an apartheid wall in and around the West Bank. They completely surround Palestinian cities like Kalkilia. The ICJ rules that this is out of bounds, a violation of international law. And the Palestinians can do nothing because they have been so weakened by the Oslo Accords, the peace process, and the Palestinian Authority, they have no means to push back. That's when BDS was declared, boycott, divestment, and sanctions, because the international Palestinian diaspora said, we have to act now and call on the world to enforce this specific ruling at the ICJ. So now we've gone from that to the direct allegation of genocide against Israel at the ICJ. This really shows how far uh, this campaign, and it's very much a civil society campaign, that has found a partner in South Africa because of South Africa's history and the demonic behavior of Israel there, how far it's progressed. Um, and it is a moment to really, I think it's a rare moment here to, to actually celebrate. And I'm also, I was very happy with the way South Africa's lawyers performed. Absolutely. And that's that's really essential background that most people don't know. So thank you for that, Max. Um, you, I, I know you had some stuff to say, too, about Galit Rajouan, another member of the Israeli team. Well, yeah, I, I covered her. I mean, her presentation was about the need to destroy hospitals uh, because hospitals were ter are terror bases. And I think, you know, I don't know where that fits into international law, but uh, the, the, I think that the, the, the most powerful piece of evidence she had was videos showing captives being uh, taken into hospitals on October 7th by Hamas militants. But these were wounded captives and it was not the doctor's choice whether to treat them or not. Doctors have to follow the Hippocratic Oath to treat everyone. Meanwhile, you had 100 Israeli doctors, including pediatricians who treat children, signing a public letter supporting Israel's destruction of Shifa Hospital, Israel's the Israeli military's invasion of Shifa Hospital. So that is an explicit violation of the Hippocratic Oath, of the violation of everything that a doctor is supposed to, the, the, the ethics of the medical profession. And, you know, no condemnation of that from the American Medical Association or anything, but uh, I didn't see any Palestinian doctors declaring support for attacking Israeli medical facilities. Okay, my bad. She was the one who talked about the the guns and the incubators. Yeah, the guns right, and the yeah, incubators. Yeah. That was like the that was even crazier than the guns in the MRI wing of Shifa. Yeah. Yeah. Which by the way, the New York Times is still trying to uh the Times is still trying to launder the claim from US and Israel that Hamas had their headquarters at Al Shifa. The New York Times is still trying to push that even though there's no evidence to support it. All the available evidence de uh, debunks. It. Even the Washington Post had to admit that it was a lie. Um, but yet that one persists. Yeah. Um, so I went to the State Department the day of the South African presentation to ask about their 
condemnation of this case. And I honestly like it, it, the condemnation came after the presentation by South Africa, but they had already condemned it before listening to the evidence. Um, was it Blinken? Blinken already declared that the case was meritless and that it was just, it was harming all the good work he was doing in the region <laughs> on his 10 nation tour. Um, this was hours before the Biden administration and the, the uh, Sunak or whoever controls him administration in London elected to attack Yemen. So the, the, the ICJ was the big issue in the room at the time. Let me say something quickly before you, yeah. the, you know, Max, I'm, I'm sorry to, to um, no, give you go for it. Yeah, but listen, this, this was masterful. This was masterful questioning here. And journalism school should, should, should play this clip. This was really well done. And uh, his answers are incredible. Um, he, he, he couldn't give a straight answer because of course they're in such an impossible position. They're a well, they're well aware of their exposure and you nailed them perfectly on this. So this is the clip. Thank you again for, for saying that. I, I, I just like felt indignant. I actually kind of just jumped in there a little out of turn because I knew he wasn't going to call on me. And I was piggybacking off another reporter who was kind of working along a similar line. Just a little context. The temperature is definitely rising in the State Department briefing room and more and more reporters are calling them out on their hypocrisy, specifically around the issue of genocide. Uh, Secretary Blinken has accused China of genocide for its treatment of the Uyghurs. But Blinken didn't point to any mass killing there. According to Euromed Monitor, 4% of the entire population of the Gaza Strip is now dead or injured in just 90 days, 65,000 tons of munitions have been dropped on the Gaza Wrong Strip, guy. three times what was dropped on Hiroshima. You have in evidence of industrial style killing. The South African legal team presented 20 minutes straight of statements on the record by Israeli leadership expressing the intent to commit genocide, for example, referring to the Palestinian population as Amalek. So how can you explain this discrepancy between Secretary Blinken accusing China uh, ex explicitly of genocide with no mass killing, presenting no evidence of the mass killing of Uyghurs, and then dismissing out of hand the potential that Israel could be committing genocide in the Gaza Strip, calling it unfounded. How do you explain this discrepancy? Uh, the same way that I just explained it to your colleague who asked essentially the same version of your question, which is that each conflict is different and any kind of determination like this uh, needs to be based on specific facts and law. And, and when it comes to the points that are made, being made in today's hearing, uh, again, I'm not going to uh, speak to those specifically. Israel will have an opportunity to address uh, some of those tomorrow. Uh, but we, again, feel that these allegations that Israel is committing genocide are unfounded. That being said, uh, we do not disagree that additional steps must and need to be taken to minimize the impact on civilians, and we'll continue to raise that directly uh, with relevant partners. And given that you fast-tracked 14, a sale of 14,000 uh, tank shells to Israel bypassing Congress. Given Secretary Blinken's participation in war, we didn't buy part. We didn't buy. I'm just going to stop you right there because the premise of your question is uh, is a little misguided. We did not bypass Congress as part of those. Uh, as 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 part of that, there is appropriate congressional notification that happens, and we complied with those okay. Uh, appropriate. Okay. Ways. More and more members of Congress are demanding oversight because they're not getting adequate oversight. But no one disputes that the U.S. is isolated in protecting Israel as it conducts this operation as it calls it in Gaza. No one disputes the direct U.S. role. So the question is, the Secretary Blinken, who went to Israel first, declaring as, he was there as a Jew, identifying with the ethno-religious character of this state, which is now standing accused of the potential to commit genocide, is Secretary Blinken concerned that ruling in favor of South Africa in this case could set the stage for his own prosecution or that of your colleagues? I'm just not going to get ahead of uh, hypotheticals, and um, you probably shouldn't either. Jackson, go ahead. You probably shouldn't either. I don't know if that was like a, a threat. I guess he's saying he'll never call on me again. Well, that's a fascinating answer because obviously if he thinks that Israel's not guilty of genocide, then obviously he would have nothing to worry about uh, when it comes to Tony Blinken's potential uh, complicity. So he should have said that. Instead, he declines to give a direct answer. He says, I'm not going to get into that. Uh, and that says to me that they actually are worried about Tony Blinken's exposure because, of course, 
he is complicit. And on this point too about how we did we did not bypass Congress, they did bypass Congress. They did it. They, they've done it twice now. They've invoked emergency powers. Um, uh, they've invoked uh, uh, emergency uh, powers to yes. give them the authority to avoid congressional review. Now they yes they notified Congress that they're doing that, but that's not congressional review. That's bypassing. That's basically telling Congress that they're being that they're being bypassed. That's what he's basically saying. Uh, that's what he's claiming is proper oversight, which of course it is not. So he was it's wrong a, to correct you on that. Yeah, it's the same thing they did with Yemen. Yeah, they're telling Congress they're invoking the AUMF post 9-11 AUMF, which has been on the books for over 20 years, should have been sunset a long time ago. There are emergency laws still on the books for Libya, for Syria. I mean, it's just an endless series of emergency actions being taken to circumvent Congress. And he actually had the gall to assert that somehow Congress had been <laughs> notified. When you have like Democratic senators who are like, you know, mainstream, not very progressive, now complaining about the lack of oversight. And what are these tank shells for? Yeah. I mean, we've covered the case of Dunya Abu Mosin, who was a 13-year-old girl whose entire family was killed in an airstrike. Her leg was blown off. She miraculously survived, was in a bed at Al Nasser Hospital, had given interviews about how she wanted to be a medical professional and help other people get prosthetics and um, treat other amputees. There are thousands of child amputees in the Gaza Strip now. Over a thousand have uh, undergone procedures without anesthetic. She had her head blown off by a U.S. tank shell fast-tracked by Tony Blinken and Joe Biden in that hospital. And this is happening day after day. So this is his response. And it's not just academic or hypothetical to consider the potential for Tony Blinken and company to be prosecuted. Over 100 South African lawyers have warned the US of their intention to take them to the ICJ for their role in this genocide in Gaza and for the historic US role in protecting Israel. Um, I mean, this is from a prominent group of international legal professionals in South Africa addressed to the president of the U.S., Kamala Harris, Tony Blinken, and Mike Johnson, the Speaker of the House. Notice of intention to hold the government of the United States of America liable and complicit for the ongoing international crimes perpetrated in Israel-Palestine against the Palestinian people. And the crimes continued, continued throughout Israel's presentation today. So it's not just a hypothetical. And uh, so I, I, I should get into it. Absolutely. Uh, meanwhile, the British Foreign Secretary uh, admitted this week that Israel has turned off Gaza's water, uh, which he said they shouldn't do. And then there was this amazing exchange where he's questioned to state the obvious. Well, if, you, if you're admitting that they've turned off the water, then isn't that a war crime? And watch him squirm his way out of giving an answer. I mean, two or three minutes ago, in answer, uh, a reply to the chair, you said, and I quote, one of the things we'd like the Israelis to do is switch the water back on. Now, that says that they turned it off. It says that you recognize they have the power to turn it on. Therefore, isn't turning water off and having the ability to turn it back on but choosing not to, isn't that a breach of international humanitarian law? It's just something they ought to do, in my no, opinion. No, I'm, uh, of course they should do it. Every human <laughs> you don't cut people's water supply off. But I'm asking you in your position as foreign secretary, well, I don't, around I mean, the point of international humanitarian yeah. law, if Israel have the power to turn the water back on that they turned off, surely that is a flagrant breach of international humanitarian law. Well, I, I, I'm, I'm not a lawyer. My, my view is they ought to switch it on because uh, the north of Gaza, the conflict is now effectively over there. And so getting more water and power into northern Gaza would be a very good thing to do. You don't have to be a lawyer to make a judgment about that. You just have to be a human being. Forgive me, Sir Philip. Under international obligations, do occupying powers have an obligation to provide access to water? Yes or no? This is Alicia Kearns. Well, you thing. asked me a technical Jared, question. Philip, so Philip I, I'm really, forgive me, you and I have played this dance enough times. This is Cameron's we deputy. Know, under international law, there is an obligation for occupying powers to provide water. 
You know, a technical question about occupying powers uh, and what their obligations are in international <laughs> law. I imagine you're correct, Chair, but I'm, I'm also not a uh, not a liar. I also just would point out. I Philip, don't... Just, just bear in mind, we want to have. Uh, we've come to such a good place working with you yeah. because we have the confidence that you do know these details, and that's what your colleagues say. You know that it is not that you presume I'm correct. That is the duty on an occupying power. Yeah, so yes. yeah, I think that I think that yes. is right. Um, so, so, yeah, so yes. But I would also add that in answering your questions earlier about occupying, uh, occupying, so occupation. I'm not asking you to apply it to Israel. The facts are, though, that they are required to. I mean, imagine if Russia was cutting off Ukraine's water. Would these top British officials dither on whether or not that's a war crime? Uh, claim to not be lawyers. It's such an obvious way to avoid subjecting their ally to uh, minimal accountability and to con justify continue supporting it. But, you know, it's on the record now. David Cameron acknowledged in that hearing that he's consulting foreign office lawyers frequently on the legality of Israel's actions, including cutting off the water. And so he's implicitly acknowledging that Israel's committing war crimes. I mean, it's on the record. And the U.S. is running around trying to scare all of these little, all their little tools and vassals. Uh, they, Justin Trudeau held his tongue on what was happening at the ICJ and finally came out and said Israel's not committing genocide. I can imagine the American ambassador telling him, you know, various trade dealers are not going to go through. Tariffs are going to go up unless you do this. Yeah. Uh, and there you have David Cameron and his deputy, Sir Philip, eating his, like literally eating his words because they're so afraid to acknowledge what they, which is what's staring them in the face, which is that Israel's not only cut off the water, cut off fuel, cut off electricity, they're not allowing the 1.1 million people to return to northern Gaza. And Cameron acknowledges the, or says the conflict is over there. Uh, they're not allowing them to return to their homes, which have been totally destroyed. There's another part in that hearing that is really fascinating in which Cameron is asked about British captives. There are two points that interested me or I thought were significant about that exchange. First, David Cameron is asked, have any British captives, British nationals who are captive in Gaza come out? And he said, has to, he reluctantly admits no which means that Israel's military objectives have failed and the UK refuses, is refusing. He's failing in his job to push for a ceasefire, which is the only way that their own citizens will come out. Number two, he refuses to identify those captives. Why? Because they're not captives or hostages. They're prisoners of war. They're British nationals who went to Israel or the Jewish state in Israel and the Levant as foreign fighters under much more, with much more agency than Shemaima Begin did when she was sort of manipulated by a British MI6 spy into joining ISIS and who had her citizenship stripped. They've gone there to fight. They were captured as active duty soldiers on base as part of the Gaza division, enforcing the siege of this open air prison. Now they're prisoners of war. And he can't say their names because it would compromise their status. So uh, very revealing hearings. I wish we would have something like that in our own Congress. Yeah, Just like I wish, I wish we had question hour for Joe Biden. Can you imagine Joe Biden under question hour? <laughs> yeah, yeah. You imagine. got me all worked up showing Cameron. Why is Cameron foreign secretary? Like he was destroyed by the British Parliamentary Commission on Libya. They revealed him to be like the worst failure and liar on Libya. And now he's back. What a meritocracy. Well, they can replace him with Boris Johnson. I'm, I'm sure I'm sure that's going to work. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. But imagine that kind of questions uh, for coming from a member of Congress to a U.S. official. You know, there's a, you know, I can remember like Ilhan Omar had a great hearing where she questioned Elliot Abrams. That's like a rare time when one of these U.S. war criminals actually got some good oversight. from. But that, that, that's one in a million. Um Whenever they, even the few members of Congress who take the right stance, their questioning usually is pretty weak if they ever they got the opportunity. We just don't have any real chance here 
uh, to ask any real questions unless it's people like you, Max, in the State Department briefing room. That's the only place it really goes down. Well, I actually came up through a tunnel in that room. <laughs> it was a Chabad tunnel built by migrants, and I turned it into a resistance tunnel. Um, so we'll see if I get let back. But uh, as I said, the temperature is rising, and most people in the Democratic Party, like Democratic Party voters, want a ceasefire. Cindy McCain called for a ceasefire. Like most Americans want a ceasefire. And Biden just won't do it. Blinken won't do it. Blinken, he's such a hero, isn't he? Like Time Magazine made him out to be like man of the year, basically, for just going over on one of the most anti-diplomatic tours I've seen since, uh, what? Since... Um, Condi Rice tried to put together the coalition of the billing for Iraq. There he is, everybody. The envoy. Uh, in a glow. I haven't read it yet, but uh, I mean, what's there to learn? Um, apparently, there's a line in there where it says that Mike Pompeo, Blinken's predecessor, signed his emails. I'm not joking here. Signed his emails with the phrase, keep on crushing it. That's apparently oh in this God. time article. Keep on crushing it. So this man right here, Blinken, is crushing it. Um, when he went to the Middle East, it was billed as this, like, um, he was going there, like, what's the term? He's going there to de-escalate tensions, right? That's his grand mission, de-escalate tensions. Uh, he talked about recently uh, stopping the cycle of warfare. And, of course, what happens right after Blinken's visit to the Middle East? Uh, Biden bombs Yemen, uh, becoming, I don't know, the third, the fourth consecutive president to do so. Um, everybody yeah. bombs Yemen, Biden's no exception. Here it is. Look at this. Blinken looks to de-escalate conflict as tensions spike in the Middle East. <laughs> yes. Here's more. Uh, Middle East nations must prevent endless cycle of violence. Blinken. That was Reuters, January 6th. It's just a cycle of violence. We just yeah. got to get off it. And that's what, but his real reason for that trip. I mean, why was why else was he in the UAE? Was to marshal support for a military operation expanding the war yeah 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 so we should we should get into that i mean the united states yesterday attacked yemen it's been attacking yemen since 2015 when the ansar Allah movement uh led by the al Houthi movement stormed into power in Sana'a, it was coming under attack constantly from the then Yemeni government. They took charge of most of the country after facing a total siege, bombing with British and US support, British and US weapons carried out by the Saudi UAE and Qatari coalition. So it's basically a US-UK GCC war on one of the poorest countries in the world. And they withstood the attack. They defeated the Saudi mercenary army. They demonstrated uh, their ability to fight for their sovereignty and independence and return Sana'a to real relevance in the Arab world at a time when the US had wanted the power to shift mm -hmm. to these completely complicit mon um, monarchic states with heavy Wahhabi influence, which we're planning to normalize with Israel. And so I don't know if you want to address the context here any further. Well, but. just, you know, the critical thing I, I want to say about this is this is yet another case of the uh, Biden team uh, getting itself involved and further escalating a crisis that it created because it was the Obama administration, the Obama Biden administration that gave Saudi Arabia the green light to attack Yemen. Saudi Arabia came to Washington first, uh, met with the Obama White House. Uh, Biden, of course, was fully on board with this and asked for the green light because Saudi Arabia could not do this, could not attack Yemen without the blessing and support of the U.S., who provided it with weaponry and refueling and intelligence. So just like in Ukraine, where the entire crisis there originates with the Obama Biden team backing a coup uh, in Kiev in February 2014, so nearly 10 years ten years ago next month, and then supporting the coup government that it brought to power in launching an assault against the 
ethnic uh, Russians of Ukraine who launched a revolt against the coup government. Uh, and just like in Syria, where now the U.S. has to deal with the or claims that it wants to deal with the presence of ISIS in Syria, uh, which results from the U.S. and its allies waging a dirty war in Syria, where they sided with ISIS and Al Qaeda and trying to overthrow the Syrian government. But just like in those two conflicts, now Yemen is again once a, a place where the Biden administration is now escalating even more uh, in a country where it basically caused the problem to begin with, because without U.S. support. Saudi Arabia never would have launched that war in Yemen back in, that was what, 2015? Completely. And it was it was a terrorist war, bombing school buses. It was a lot like what we see in Gaza, uh, uh, blockading the port of Hodeida, trying to starve the people of Yemen out. Yeah. And we, so we've come full, full circle. Yemen is retaliating for the pain of the Yemeni people, the pain of the people of Gaza, and they're acting just as the South African government is on a moral imperative, unlike the U.S. allies who just simply want to stay within the transatlanticist realm. Why is Australia supporting this attack on Yemen? It isn't on a moral imperative. What has Yemen ever done to the people of to Australia? Yeah. Nothing. They've, it's ridiculous. They're just trying to get more economic deals from the U.S. and be part of AUKUS and the Quad maintain Australia as a, you know, a little European bastion within the Pacific. That's what this is about for them. For the Houthis, this is personal for the, and they have a mass base. They control 70 to 80% of Yemen. The government the U S recognizes in Yemen, their government is based in a luxury ho hotel in Riyadh. They're fake. They're like the Juan Guaido of the, the Persian Gulf or the Gulf of Arabia. They are non-existent, and you watched the coverage last night on U.S. mainstream media of this assault on Yemen, and you have all these military rent-a-general hacks come on and refer to the Houthis, first of all. It's, it's basically Yemen, okay? It's the Yemeni government as a terrorist organization, as if they're just this, you know, as if they're Al-Qaeda. Yeah. As if they're, you know, based in the mountains, hiding in caves, just carrying out these attacks when they have a gig they've been bringing out millions of people, literally millions, the biggest demonstrations in the world for Palestine. I don't know. And they've been taking action by blockading ships as part of what they say is their, you know, legal duty to stop a genocide. When a genocide is going on, states actually have obligations to stop it. And that's what Yemen says it's doing in stopping ships from going through the Red Sea uh, by engaging in this blockade. And their demands are to stop the genocide. That's what uh -huh. Craig Mohyber, who we've interviewed here at the Gray Zone, who is the head of the New York office of the UN's office of, of the Human Rights Commissioner, who resigned in disgust at the UN's conduct on Gaza, said himself that nations have an obligation to stop genocide. And that is what Yemen is doing. So, Yemen. Could be seen as actually acting within the scope of international law would certainly have a stronger defense at the icj than israel and it's killing a lot less people and they're not yeah. like massacring crews on these ships no it's bloodless the message. it's bloodless no one has died yet from any um attack by ansar Allah, the houthis um it, it's bloodless and yet biden decides to launch this attack and by the way as as we're recording this right now uh, the news that I'm seeing is that uh, there are now airstrikes on the uh, Sana International Airport in the capital of Yemen. So uh, if this is the U.S. doing it, presumably, U.S. bombing Yemen's international airport, which is the standard tactic. That's what Israel does in Syria, for example. So many times it's bombed the Damascus and Aleppo airports. And now it looks like that's the tactic the U.S. is bringing to Yemen. And the U.S. always acts as though these countries, it acts as though they don't have a means to retaliate. They occupy Northeastern Syria and steal, steal their oil, expecting that no one will attack them or that they're too weak. The US presence in Iraq is pretty much under the same premise that they can't be harmed. They can't be retaliated against. US sanctions against Russia, the U.S. funding and support for the Ukrainian military to 
constantly put pressure on the Russian frontiers and attack the ethnic Russian population of Donbass for wanting to secede from their nationalist regime. Russia's always, Russia's supposed to be the adult in the room. They're arming Japan, getting it to violate Article 9 of its constitution after World War II to put missiles on islands, pointing at China. They're arming the crap out of Taiwan, violating China's sovereignty. And everybody's supposed to be the adults in the room except the U.S. Finally, one of the poorest countries in the world actually steps up and the U.S. is attacking them as though this won't expand. I swear, the people in the Biden administration actually believe that they can carry out these attacks and there will not be a response that will actually affect the U.S. and it will not lead to retaliation. Because what will the U.S. do if one of its warships actually gets hit yeah. by the Yemeni military? Yep. They will have to escalate. Yeah. And yeah. And Biden, if Biden doesn't know that, his aides certainly do, but they still proceed. Uh, and in their in their statement, whoever wrote this for Biden, the, the the term freedom of navigation is mentioned multiple times. So Biden's acting to defend freedom of navigation. Well, just looking at his record on that. Um, what about the freedom of navigation for Iranian ships trying to break the US-led blockade of Syria? So when Iran tries to bring oil to Syria to help ease the impact of the dirty war and the sanctions on Syria and the fact that the U.S. is stealing Syria's oil by occupying the Northeast. Israel, with U.S. approval and assistance, bombs those ships. So they don't have freedom navigation. But Yemen and Ansar Allah, when they act to stop a genocide by uh, blocking Israeli ships and allied ships in the Red Sea, now they get bombed uh, in the name of freedom of, of navigation. And the claim that you know, this is Israeli strikes on these uh, ships that are trying to reach Syria. These are actually joint U.S.-Israeli strikes because, as the Wall Street Journal also reported, U.S. secretly reviews Israel's plans for strikes against... So U.S. is involved in all of this. So when it comes to freedom of navigation for U.S. enemies that the U.S. trying to overthrow and subvert, they have none. When it comes to defending uh, the genocide and stopping efforts to block the genocide, Anyway, it, it's bombs away. And that's what Biden is doing right now, including as we speak, bombing the Yemen, the airport inside Sana, the capital of Yemen. Yeah, I mean, when I was in the State Department briefing room, uh, the spokesman Vidant Patel was fulminating about Iran taking what he said was a Micronesian flagged Greek owned ship, which was contained like what, 200,000 barrels of oil, maybe less from Iraq. Uh, he didn't provide the proper context, which was that that ship used to be called the Suez Raja, was owned by Iran, and the U.S. just pulled a straight-up pirate operation on that ship, offloaded 100 barrels of crude. I guess they must have sold it on the international market. And then they just renamed the ship, put a different flag on it, and sent it out there. And they didn't expect Iran to actually retaliate. In the way they did, they're still down 800,000 barrels, by the way. Iran could take a few more ships if it wanted. But the U.S. has been carrying out high seas piracy against Iran. Israel's been attacking Iranian shipping left and right. Uh, and what has the U.S. been doing to Venezuela? They've been pirating. They've been, they've been taking Iranian ships, bringing oil equipment and oil to Venezuela, which was under a de facto siege by the U.S. Navy. And they've been stealing Venezuela's assets through Juan Guaido. They stole Iran, uh, Venezuela's biggest asset Ven uh, in Sitco. So, I mean, the U.S. is just, and, and along with placing one third of the world population under sanctions, it's stealing and conducting pir piracy around the world. And now they're getting a taste of their own medicine. This is not terrorism. Uh, this is, you know, holding accountable one of the world's biggest terrorists. And they're doing so on behalf of the people of Gaza. I mean, they're using the tactics of economic pressure that also form the basis of BDS, which is fundamentally nonviolent. I want to play one of my favorite uh, justifications for NATO military action I've ever heard. Uh, this is UK Armed, For Armed Forces Minister James Heapy. And listen to how he defends the strikes on Yemen last night was a limited proportionate necessary get more volume in self-defense 
of our warships in the region who themselves are so i i can't boost the volume more than that but i'll just yeah. play this one more time of our in self-defense of our warships in the region who them so if you didn't catch that he said it's in self-defense of our warships <laughs> in the region why are your warships in the, in the region uh your region is not yemen your region is the uk but yeah. this guy's the gall to claim that we're we're we're, we're self-defending our warships that are right by yemen um it's just you know it's on it's just imperial hubris straight up and with no shame whatsoever and by the way we didn't mention it earlier when we were talking about the icj hearing or i don't think we did at least if we didn't the bbc which is airing the minister's comments the bbc somehow forgot to air live the south african presentation of the oh, genocide yeah. case at the icj but today when it was israel's turn to defend itself the bbc uh, and I think Sky News too did the same thing. Did air that? So yeah, we know that it wasn't a mistake because obviously the Foreign Office gave instructions. So brazen, it's so brazen. And uh, you know, uh, Anya Parnpil, our colleague at the Gray Zone, she tweeted out this clip of CNN anchor Aaron Burnett uh, basically doing what any U.S. anchor is obligated to do when the U.S. bombs a Middle Eastern country or, or any country, but I think especially uh, in Middle East or Africa, which is express their glee and uh so this is aaron burnett of cnn uh breaking the news of the u.s bombing yemen Warren, thank you very much uh, and, and always important to note 90 percent of the world's trade goes by ship uh and then these attacks have gone unanswered now for three months until this uh map assault this broad assault that we're talking about happening at this hour Brock <laughs> Global Affairs Analyst and retired U.S. Army Major General James Spider Marks also joins me. So, General, here we are. Finally, 27 strikes uh, on, on shipping. Uh, many of the U.S. ships targeted. Finally. That's now tonight responding. Finally. And, you know, after three months of these attacks going unanswered, finally, we bomb Yemen. Yeah, I mean, Anya recorded that off the TV. It's very hard to get a lot of clips from CNN because they don't always put everything online. So, that was basically recorded live, so apolog apologies on the volume, but it was really important to express, to, to, to expose the tone on CNN as this took place. You know, it was almost orgasmic, attacking Yemen on behalf of Israel, but not providing any context. And look who, is, look who the commentator is. It's Barak Ravid, an Israeli who actually serves in the Israeli reserves. You know, when the reservists... Uh, protested Netanyahu and refused to show up for training. Barack Ravid went on Twitter and said, I'm not showing up for training. So a member of the Israeli army who's a reporter, and he's basically a channel. I mean, he gets a lot of big scoops because he's a channel for Israeli intelligence and the Israeli military. And then they have the guy who headed military intelligence uh, for the U.S. invasion of Iraq in 2003, James Spider Marks, who had like no expertise on Yemen, did not know what he was talking about at all, just kept calling the Houthis a terror organization. Um, and it's not working. It's not like the U.S. public is in thrall of some kind of war fever like after 9-11. Uh, I think they're troubled by what we're seeing. Tucker Carlson, sort of the voice of Trumpism in the media, has warned against an expansion of the conflict leading to war with Iran. He helped keep Trump from certain actions that were going to tempt war with Iran. And the Biden administration, we were told they were going to be saying we couldn't reelect Trump because Trump was a maniac. Look where they're leading us. They're leading us straight to a conflict with Iran that Netanyahu has been spending his entire career after taking out, helping the U.S., convince the U.S. to take out Saddam, testifying before Congress that Saddam had WMD and was connected to Al-Qaeda. His next move was Iran. Um, Even came over to try to undermine Obama's Iran nuclear yes. deal, uh, trying to you know, appear before Congress about that. Yeah, um, the, the, this was crazy. I mean, it was direct interference in U.S. politics. John Boehner, the opposition leader, invites a foreign leader to attack the president. <laughs> And he, he basically called Obama a Nazi yeah. by bringing up FDR's refusal to bomb the rail lines to Auschwitz and then 
suggesting that Obama was refusing to bomb Iranian nuclear facilities. Therefore, he's a new Nazi coddler. And so here he is again. He's getting his way with Biden and Blinken easily. I, I mean, if if Yemen retaliates as they have the right to do here against the U.S. military, I don't. How does it not expand any further? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Um. I, I want a few points by uh, a friend of a gray zone, Elijah Magnier, Magnier, that I think need should be made about this in closing is thanks to the us uk attack on yemen there's more focus on gaza because this is this is about internationalizing or this is basically what yemen did was a responsibility to protect operation to stop genocide in gaza more ships avoiding the red sea uh because the us is now and the uk are attacking i mean it's even more dangerous for shipping at this point and uh, actually, there's you know less people traveling to the region in general. More solidarity among Gaza supporters, more anger at the U.S. The U.S. has now revealed itself as a direct party to this conflict. More U.S. involvement in the quagmire, for sure. Remember, the USS Eisenhower, the aircraft carrier, had actually left the region. We're going to see more U.S. and U.K. Uh, ships in the water. Um, especially submarines launching cruise missiles, more attacks on U.S. ships, for sure. U.S. ships are a target. And more joy in Iran, uh, considering that Yemen is an Iranian ally and they're stepping up for Gaza. And more distraction away from Russia and China. Uh, Tony Blinken, remember, on October 31st, Halloween, he dressed his children up as he dressed his son up as Zelensky at the White House Halloween party and his daughter, he dressed in blue and yellow. And what he was doing was trying to keep the focus on Ukraine it was, as it was fading into the pile, pools of blood pouring out of Gaza, uh, China as well. Um, so Elijah's right. This is a strategic folly for the U.S. There's one thing the U.S. could have done the Biden administration could have done, just snap their fingers and done. It would have made this all go away, the whole problem, and would have caused Hezbollah to go north of the Latani River. Ceasefire. Just do the ceasefire. Just do it. Yeah. John McCain's wife wants. Yeah. But they won't do it. They, they will not do it. do it. They cannot do it. Yeah. And they know also, by the way, that their unfettered support for Israel uh, encourages attacks on U.S. soldiers. They don't care. Uh, this is an example from 2021 um an assessment like from u.s intelligence officials and in the, in the new york times that an armed drone strike on an american military base in southern syria was iranian retaliation for israeli airstrikes in syria so the Biden administration has plenty of evidence that when it backs israel and its attacks uh around the region right now especially in gaza with a genocide there that that invites attacks on Americans who are still in Syria, of course, illegally, because Syria doesn't want them there. But they don't care. They just don't care. They don't care about the risks of escalation, whatever Tony Blinken gets loyal media stenographers to write about him. They don't care. They're just Biden, as he's done his whole political career, is ideological commit, ideologically committed to Zionism, ideologically committed to the Israeli state. Uh, he famously uh, you know, uh, encouraged Menachem Begin to be even more deadly in the invasion of Lebanon, saying that you know that it's fine to kill civilians. That even uh, reportedly Begin was like taken aback at what a fanatic Biden was. That's who he is, and he's bringing that legacy right now to office in such an extreme way. Yeah, who will be the f first American soldier and the last American soldier to die for Israel's genocide? That's what this is about. It's about the U.S. is bombing Yemen supposed to protect freedom of navigation for the genocidal apartheid entity that is preventing the freedom of navigation for 1.1 million people who cannot return to their homes in northern Gaza, which no longer exist to prevent freedom of navigation for all the fishermen of, the, of Gaza who've had their industry wiped out by Israel's siege 
I remember in 2014 going on one of those fishing boats, seeing the tragic catch that this fisherman was being driven into ruin, who spent all night on a 12 hour trip at blocked at three kilometers in at sea by an Israeli Navy boat threatening to shoot him and everyone on board unless he turned back. Just watching him haul that catch of all these little crabs and tiny little fish back to the market and see what he could sell. Where's their freedom of navigation? So Yemen is stepping up for them. And Yemen is exposing all the R2P humanitarian interventionist frauds in the Biden administration by doing a real humanitarian intervention, yes. something we've never seen the United States do. No, never. And also, I mean, again, similar to South Africa, what does Ansar Allah, Yemen, gain from doing this? Nothing. They're just inviting serious consequences from the world's top hegemon, but yet they're doing it out of principle and out of a sense of justice and solidarity. Uh, and you have to admire the courage of that. This is one of the poorest countries in the world. They know the consequences, but they're saying they're willing to step up and take action to stop a genocide. Uh, that, as you say, that is actually humanitarian intervention personified. And by the way, bloodlessly, because they didn't kill anybody. They're actually just trying to do what they can, which is block ships, to, in order to put pressure on the U.S. and Israel to, to stop the Gaza genocide. So, yeah, just one, exactly. Uh, and no one will say that in U.S. mainstream media. No guest will come on um, and, and just make that clear point. Why are they doing this? The same for the same reason. No one can just come out and articulate Hamas's political objectives with October 7th. That oh, it was just about killing Jews. Oh, this is just about terrorizing the U.S. and Israel. If, if you want to be stupid, keep watching CNN or Fox or even the, the New York Times is not helping people understand Yemen's motives. If you want to talk to try talking to the New York Times subs subscriber class about Yemen and why Ansar Allah is doing this, and you'll just draw a blank. I mean, the, yeah. at best, we'll say Iran is trying to uh, tempt exactly. us into war. Exactly. Uh, and they Everything. always refer to them as an Iranian proxy. And the yeah. Chirons on CN all have to say Iran-backed Houthis. And they keep calling them the Houthis, or they call them the Houthis. <laughs> it's like Houthi and the Blowfish. Yeah, Like Darius Rucker is out there <laughs> just stopping shipping. <laughs> but, you know, I mean, he anyway... It's pathetic. It's like how they say uh, Hamas controlled Gaza health ministry says 30,000 dead. Here's the reality. This is Sada. This is the reality. This is a movement, a political movement with a mass base. It's not some random terrorist group hiding in caves like Al Qaeda was in southern Yemen with the support of Israel and the UAE and Saudi Arabia. Are they just going to defeat all these people? This was their rally against U.S. aggression. This is what the U.S. has awakened. And they're chanting that they have no fear. So... Let's see what happens. It's not going to be. It's it, it's it's not going to lead to de-escalation uh, or deterrence. That's the word we keep hearing: deterrence, deterrence, deterrence. Does it look like they've deterred the people of Yemen? Uh, just want to send a quick thank you and shout out to Joshua Valadares. Uh, to Mad Max and the buzzsaw words can't describe the work you're doing. You mean so much to us. Be well and stay safe. Rock on. Thank you so much, uh, Joshua, for that generous contribution. Um, we are working directly with journalists in Gaza. We're going to be putting out some new material from there this week. Um, so that helps support them as well. Um, just while we're waiting for Aaron, quick question here. What does Israeli public opi opinion read the genocide case? Well, it is, uh, and thank you, Branko, for the super chat. Um, 
their 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 opinions are the same as the legal team and the leadership, and they consider it to be a blood libel. And uh, on that note, interesting poll from the Israeli Democracy Institute earlier this month. Over 50% of Israelis think the best way of getting the captives back in the Gaza Strip is through more military force, and only about 20% believe in negotiation or cutting another deal. So in other words, most Jewish Israelis do not support getting the captives out and would rather camp continue to quote unquote victory, whatever that means, which is total destruction. Um, so I feel sorry for the civilian captives there now, people like Yarden Bibas, whose entire family was killed in an Israeli airstrike on Gaza. Uh, he is pleading for uh, the Israeli leadership to cut a deal with Hamas so that he can get out and his family can have a proper burial, including small children. Um, would re I would really like to see that happen. Unfortunately, most Jewish Israelis don't seem to want that. Um, moving along, I mean, uh, that, I mean, I think that's, that's a perfect transition to the next segment, which I think we can cover pretty quickly. Is, uh, is Haaretz actually published an op-ed on how Israel's military is conducting the Hannibal Directive presently against the captives in the Gaza Strip. It doesn't want to cut a deal for them. Their presence there, their, the fact that they're still alive is a problem for the Israeli military and Israeli leadership, and it's deliberately seeking to kill them. Uh, and now we know through a major report in Israel's top or most popular publication, Ynet, Yediot Aranot, by Ronan Bergman, that on October 7th, there were orders for a mass Hannibal, meaning Hannibal directive, meaning deliberate strikes on Israelis to prevent them from becoming captive, being taken into the Gaza Strip. Um, that means many more people than we knew were among the, what, 1,100, 11, 1,150 1, Israelis killed on October 7th. Aaron, what does is, what is Ronan Bergman say here? Uh, the main highlights all are that Israel ordered all combat units on October 7th to stop Palestinian fighters from returning to Gaza, quote, at all costs. Um, and even though they didn't explicitly say this was under the Hannibal procedure, the Hannibal directive, it basically was in practice. It says that about 70 vehicles were shot by a combat helicopter, an anti-tank missile or a tank, and at least in some cases, everyone in the vehicle was killed. Uh, it was not clear at this time how many of the abductees were killed due to the activation of this command. Okay, well, if it's not clear at this time uh, to the Israeli military, to the Israeli government, it's pretty clear just from logic that if you're firing from combat helicopters, from tanks, uh, at vehicles, then everyone in those vehicles that is struck by these weapons is going to be killed. So then it raises the question of how many people, how many of its own people did Israel kill on October 7th? Yeah. And that's the question that only a few people in media have been brave enough to raise. And you're among the max, you and our colleagues at the Electronic Intifada and Mondo Weiss, a few other places, but that's about it. And for doing that, all of you have been called conspiracy theorists. Well, now and this you. is... Well, but again, I'm just following. I'm just, I'm just being. Oh, sorry, honest. you're just a rape apologist. My bad. <laughs> I've just been following your lead. But uh, now, now this is Israel's major newspaper, Yediot Aronot, and its premier, uh, one of its premier correspondents, Ronan Bergman, who also writes the New York Times, reporting this, uh, reporting what has been obvious from the start, and now is confirmed. Um, so I don't know. What's your reaction to to this uh, report? I mean, he's not just confirming. He's demonstrating that the Hannibal Directive was carried out on a much wider scale than anyone's been willing to admit, yeah. um, and that these orders were to hit every car that was going towards Gaza, and that in many cases, everyone was killed. So it has a lot of implications. The Israeli Prime Minister, Netanyahu, has put out a new site. Um, can't remember the name of the site off the top. I'll find Hamas it. Massacre or something like that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Yeah. It's just, it's, it's gory photos. It's much of what is contained in the 47 minute snuff film that Israel's foreign ministry has been showing to like Dr. Phil and Chris Cuomo and other leading lights of our intelligentsia to try to win their support for genocide. So Hamas massacre, I think was the old site that I always suspected was an Israeli operation. And now they've come out with the same font and format in something that Netanyahu promoted. But if you look closely at the photos, a lot of them show people who are burnt to a crisp in vehicles under the Hannibal directive and were definitely killed by Israeli hellfire missiles or tanks, heavy weapons. I mean, there's just no question. Many of them uh, could have been people from Gaza, not just Hamas, but some of the onlookers who came in, who just drove in to see what was going on. Uh, also kind of like assorted riffraff. Um, you know, there were crimes committed against people in Israel by in people infiltrated from Gaza, like the Thai worker who was beaten to death with a shovel that was done by just like criminals who came in from Gaza who had, were like up to no good, not Hamas. Um, but then you see a lot of, um, piles of bodies in these atrocity photos. And they say that these were from the Nova electronic music festival. They're all burnt. They're just so badly burnt. And it doesn't look like they were killed with bullets. And they're wearing jeans and they're all mostly male. Okay. Is you can look at the look at the footage from the Supernova Sukkot Electronic Music Festival. It's out there. None of the guys are wearing jeans. It's really hot. Israelis, you know, Jewish Israeli males, they wear shorts a lot. They wear like tank tops. These guys are wearing cheap jeans and like having been in the Gaza Strip, you, you, you're you, pretty much everyone wears jeans or trousers, no matter how hot it is. It's yeah. kind of like a cultural faux pas for a guy to go out and wear shorts. If you're on the beach, you can do it yeah. or you're, you know, you're walking around your house in your sandals, but otherwise you don't do it. So that's kind of a telltale sign to me that a lot of what we're seeing in this Israeli atrocity photos are people that they killed. Uh, there are a few photos that clearly showed um partiers from the nova festival who are shot with bullets but they're just a few and the rest are just like piles of burned bodies so it just raises more serious issues with the credibility of israel's evidence about october 7th and i think after israel's big presentation at the icj i don't know how much more they have left to keep the public focused on october 7th I mean, this is Ronan Bergman. I mean, this guy, you look at his book, it, it, it is worth reading, like no matter what side you're on in Israel, Palestine, uh, rise up and kill. It's about Israel's assassination policy, but, uh, and it shows Israel has used terrorism, like straight up terrorism, like creating a, a fake, uh, Palestinian terrorist group and then attacking civilians with bombings in Beirut during the eighties. But the book is endorsed by like the former heads of the Mossad and Shin Bet who are Ronan Bergman's sources. He's not like an anti-Zionist. He's not. Oh, no, no, no. I mean, the reason why he's a writer for the New York Times as well is because he's probably the most well-connected Israeli journalist today in terms of connected on the inside of the government and former officials. Um, these are his sources. Uh, he, and he, you know, he is, and he's, he serves their mission. He serves their cause. But this article obviously comes from his sources and they're people who are not happy with Netanyahu and uh, who are willing to admit this, even though it completely, it blows yet another massive hole in Israeli propaganda. Um, raising the question of, I mean, you have to wonder, I mean, like were the majority of the Israeli civilians killed on October 7th? Were they killed by Hamas or were they killed by Israel? Uh, that's a legitimate question. If you have it now confirmed that Israeli tanks and helicopters were ordered to fire on all vehicles containing um, Israelis fleeing, you know, fleeing, fleeing to Gaza, uh, uh, or or even fleeing that area. It's like it's a legitimate question to ask. Yeah, uh, I found the site by the way that uh, Netanyahu is promoting, and uh, I showed it too before as you were talking. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Hamas massacre. Yeah. All right. So, yeah. As all of you know, and you, if you watched last week, we called Liza Devoskin from the Washington Post, who is preparing this hit piece on us, and Electronic Intifada, and who knows who else over this very story. 
that's now in Israel's biggest newspaper. Uh, you know, what happened to that? Is it ever going to happen? Has she been removed from the story? She should be uh, for the reasons we pointed out. But now, I mean, what else can anyone say? Is she going to do, is she going to attack Israeli media and accuse them of disinformation now? <laughs> yeah. Imagine her writing the same letter that she wrote you about like accusing you of minimizing October 7th. Is she going to write that to, to Ronan Bergman now? Um, yeah, I but know. she's going through like, she's, she's going through like what a lot of cult members go through when the leader is exposed as like a fraud or a sexual predator and they actually deepen their belief and start defending the cult leader leader even more deeply. Um, yeah. This is, you know, she's, she's basically in the Zionist section of Jonestown right now <laughs> as are, I mean, all, all Zionists. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, we look forward to the Washington Post piece. I kind of hope it comes out because it'll be so hilarious. And uh, everyone should watch uh, EI's Electronic Intifada's live stream, their last live stream about that. Because like Ali goes into some of her past work and it's just amazing Like that someone like this gets a, like has a job. Maybe it's not. No, it's not. Um, so should we uh, move to Gonzalo or... Is there anything else to get yeah, out of Yeah, well, way? I mean, the only thing I think to add on this front is that another major uh, Israeli uh, uh, propaganda story is, continues to fall apart, and that is this allegation that uh, Hamas used rape as a tool uh, of war. There was a big New York Times investigation on that. We covered it last week. Yeah, so I don't want to dwell too much on this because we've yeah. done it so much. But. Well, just I recommend for people who haven't seen it, uh, check out the story that Max did at thegrayzone.com, screams without proof, questions for New York Times about shoddy Hamas rape report. I helped out a little bit with this, but again, this was Max's work. And it's devastating in taking apart that article that was in the New York Times uh, alleging uh, Hamas sexual violence on October 7th. And Max, you submitted questions to the New York Times. Of course, we've received no answers. No one, as I predicted, has stepped forward to defend the New York Times report in the aftermath of your debunk of your debunking because it's so devastating um the contradictory claims of the purported witnesses the ridiculous allegations that the new york times uh printed even though there's no forensic evidence to to support them and you think with claims of like uh a severed breast and severed heads there'd be at least some at least one piece of forensic evidence that could support this but of course there's zero and that's why I think this story is going to fade from public views because it's so ridiculous. It's uh, it's an egregious case of journalistic malpractice. You exposed it, and I guarantee we will not be seeing any response from Jeffrey Gettleman, the author of this piece at the Times, or anybody else because the, they this piece they did was indefensible, as confirmed by the family of Gal Abdush, who is the featured uh, victim in this story. The New York Times tries to portray her as a rape victim. Her own family called out the New York Times for exploiting them and for making a claim that is also undermined by all the available evidence. So the silence in response to your debunking of the story is deafening. Yeah, uh, I added some updates to um, to my debunking and uh, clarification. And they're on Twitter. I'll add it to the piece. Um, and I think they're, they're basically what is happening now is instead of the Israeli investigation expanding, the counter investigation is expanding with lots of citizen journalists rising to the fore. And we're going to see more debunking of this article and of the Israeli government's attempt to put forward uh, the propaganda construct without any evidence in order to justify its genocide and Gaza. There's a great piece, by the way, Consortium News by our friend Gareth Porter on this very issue. Um, you know, Asa Wynn Stanley's doing good work on this at Electronic Intifada. Mondo Weiss has some group called Short the Short String that's doing a lot on it. And I'll shout out anyone uh, because they're, it, the, they've dismantled this from top to bottom. And we also have to keep in mind that this is also designed to take up our time and energy so we're not focusing on the crimes Israel's committing in the Gaza Strip. Um, I, I didn't have this in our initial material, but I want to highlight it if I can find it because it really shows the irony 
of these allegations. Um, yeah, here we go. You know, because Palestinians on camera are suffering sexual, sexual humiliation. Palestinian men are being stripped, dragged away in trucks, blindfolded in the cold. Um, you know, that is a form of humiliation. And now we, we also have in Nusserat, a Palestinian woman declaring Israeli soldiers undressed us completely naked, including my 14-year-old girl, gathered us in a hole and burned our underwear in front of our eyes. Soldiers released us naked and shouted at us, come on, move you animals. And then they stole her money. She said they stole 10,000 Israeli shekels worth of gold. And they took the young children naked. And they threw us gathered in a hole and started shooting above our heads. Then they burned the structures around us. They did the unthinkable with us. They spared nothing. Stole gold, money, phones, our underwear in front of us, they burned. They burned your underwear? Yes. In front of our eyes, in front of our eyes. My sons and daughters are laying here on the street. Nothing, not even a cover, no, no, no clothes, not a thing. And they released them naked. Then they said, come on, get out, you animals. So I hope, uh, you know, Jake Tapper will be reporting on this. No, he won't because you know what? He sees a brown lady with hijab and just thinks of her as, doesn't identify with her. He, he, he it probably, probably thinks she's a liar. Yeah. At this point, the, and you've made this point, Max, uh, the only thing that can get you to believe these claims of uh, Hamas sexual violence put out by the New York Times and others, the only thing that can make you believe that at this point, based on all, given the fact that all the claims do not add up, all the witnesses are contradictory, they change their stories, the only thing that they, this can be based on is a subconscious or conscious racism and a stereotype of Arab and Muslim men, this belief that they're savage barbarians who want to rape white European women. That's that's the only thing that can sustain that narrative now. Yeah, wasn't Peter Beinart like using the word savage to refer to Hamas's ac actions on October 7th? It's like, yeah, if you read his pieces, such... yeah, sorry, I'm sorry to interrupt. If you read his pieces, it's sav Hamas was savage, Hamas was barbaric. And this is a critic of Israel. It's never Israel that's savage and barbaric. And so, yeah, there is this deeply ingrained racism uh, in even people who are critical of Israel. So imagine those who are stenographers for Israel. Um, that's the only thing that can be, and of course, Peter Beinart promoted that stupid New York Times story because people, you know, despite their best intentions, have subconscious racism. And this is a good opportunity for them to confront that given how ridiculous the story is and how it continues to fall apart. I wish Edward Said were alive to really confront this aspect of the yeah. whole narrative. Um, because it's really, you know, Joseph Conrad rising to the surface here within the, the liberal intelligentsia. Um, and uh, maybe, maybe we should get Joseph Massad on to address it at some point. That'd be I great. I think he would make a great pushback guest. That'd be great. It's a great idea. Um, so actually, before we move on uh, to the hideous tragedy of Gonzalo, uh, there is a major protest tomorrow. The location had to be moved because uh, so many people are coming in. <coughs> Excuse me. The last protest was so big. I mean, I couldn't even get to the stage or get anywhere near the stage uh, in Washington. This one's going to be bigger, especially now that the U.S., the Biden administration attacked Yemen. And uh, yeah, I'm not really like a fan of the planners of the rally, but that's irrelevant. Like CARE, they were uh, doing press conferences on the need for the U.S. to bomb Syria just a few years ago. The bombing and weakening of Syria was part and parcel of the plan to destroy Gaza, and they were fully involved with that. So was uh, American Muslims for Palestine. I remember the last time I went to one of their conferences, they were basically like raising money for the Syrian opposition. I don't know if they were raising money, but they were raising support for sure. I think, I hope that this, that a new generation of activists sees that the attempt to destroy Syria and support the Syrian armed opposition, which was being supported by the U S and Israel and the UK and the same forces attacking Gaza and Yemen was part and parcel of this whole project of destroying resistance, any resistance to Israel. And I hope that they, you know, confront the leadership of these 
a Muslim American organizations. And uh, we should also see like the or certain organizations involved here that just supported endless lockdowns, endless COVID lockdowns, that that was part of uh, forcing the public into demonstrating complicity to power and avoiding protest. Um, so there's a lot of criticism I have of the groups behind this, but it doesn't matter. I mean, it's time to, it's, it, it's, it's time to unite around Palestine and it's time for a new generation of activists to come in and clean the slate. Um, and what I saw, by the way, at the last protest was it wasn't really like the professional activist class that you'll see that you, you know, you've traditionally or often seen at some of the smaller protests that really made that rally a major success. Maybe those groups got the permits uh, or arranged for the stage to be there. It was just regular uh, Muslim and Arab people from around the country, large, uh, bring, coming in with their families from far away that made that such a success. And this really uh, is a demonstration also of uh, Muslim and Arab American political power and the refusal and, and political independence, the refusal to just sign on to the Democratic Party because Trump says crazy stuff about Muslims. Um, and that's that's another thing that I think makes this rally so important. Jill Stein of the Green Party, the Green Party candidate for president, will be speaking there as far as I know. She's going to be on the ballot in, I think, all the key swing states. And she's someone who supports BDS, and supports prosecuting the Israeli leadership for the genocide in Gaza. So this is a politically significant event uh, for domestically as well. And that's uh, tomorrow, uh, as we're recording this, Saturday, January 13th at 1 o'clock in D.C. And um, I want to play, before we move on to Gonzalo Lira, Joe Biden spoke today about uh, his attack on Yemen, and I think it's worth playing the clip because it's a window into to who we're dealing with here. They're wrong, and I sent up the I sent up this morning when the strikes occurred exactly what happened. Okay, that's pretty blunt. He says you're wrong. So that's Joe I, Biden responding to criticism from Democrats who say he didn't uh, notify them. He didn't see congressional approval. He just says they're wrong, and he gives some incoherent battle about uh, babble <laughs> about um, what happened. It's not even clear what, what he's saying there. Anyway, what, that's Joe what? Biden's response to criticism that he didn't go to Congress. Uh, for his attack on Yemen, what did he? What did yeah, he say? I, I, it's it, it's kind of incoherent. <laughs> it's kind of incoherent. The exact quote is, uh, "They're wrong." And I sent up this morning when the strikes occurred exactly what happened. That's it. That's what he said. Okay. Well, yeah, yeah. looking forward to the debates. Yeah. Yeah. Do you think? I mean, do, do you think he's going to be the candidate? Um, you know, you know, I, if I were betting, I would say no, but, um, I don't, I, it's hard to get a window into his, into what's going on inside him. Uh, except Did you see the story about, uh, Obama f basically freaking out during a meeting with Biden's people. And he, he it was in the, on the front page of the Washington post, Obama apparently threw a temper tantrum. Huh? Because huh. they weren't giving Obama enough control over the campaign, and huh. he told them you have to in, you have to bring in David Plouffe, who is Obama's chief of staff and is now the top lobbyist for Uber. <laughs> and he said you have to bring in real decision makers. But he's basically saying Biden is like he's like a ghost. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the the oh, one I, thing I know the one thing I know is like the, they they tried both of them have tried to play up this idea that they're like best friends that they're really tight which is just such yeah. an obvious joke. They, Obama obviously wants nothing to do with Biden. Biden insulted him back when uh, during the Democratic primary where Biden basically said it was surprising that Obama was articulate because he's black. That was pretty much his message. Remember that where he's like he's a clean articulate uh, black guy or something like that. Um, so everything about these two is phony and constructed. So it wouldn't surprise me if there's no love lost. But then again, what does Obama even care about um, anything except for his own self-image? I mean, you know, and making money uh, at this point, like off of ne his Netflix deal. I mean, does he even care about the direction of the country? I, 
I don't think he stands for anything except for his own aggrandizement. So I don't know. Yeah, I agree. I mean, you look at his activity, post-presidential activity, he's just not very engaged. No. Uh, he's more engaged in like going to Springsteen concerts and yeah. Yeah. hanging out with Steven Spielberg and being kind of a quasi, being like a A-list celebrity. You don't hear him like expressing any concern for on any issue. He's just not engaged. Like Jimmy yeah. Carter was highly engaged as a post-president. What is Obama doing? Like the Obama Foundation doing? They like they got involved in like disinformation work that shows that just like the intelligence agencies just came, came in and were like, here's something we can do with this while you play around on Martha's Vineyard. Um, yeah, so we haven't uh, followed Ukraine as intensely because Israel, Palestine, Gaza has been the story, but. Uh, tragedy intervened today when we learned that uh, Gonzalo Lira had a, had died of neglect. This is what we've been told by his family um, in a Ukrainian prison. On January 4th, Alex Rubenstein received a note from Gonzalo's father. Um, we had been in touch with Gonzalo's father, Gonzalo Lira Sr., um, I can't really see the note that well, so maybe you want to read it. Yeah, so the note uh, was written by Gonzalo Lira, according to his father, and it says, I have, it was, uh, and the note was received, as you said, on January 4th. It says, I have had double pneumonia, both lungs, as well as uh, pneumothorax and a very severe case of edema, swelling of the body. Uh, all this started in mid October, but was ignored by the prison. They only admitted I had pneumonia at a December 22nd hearing. I'm about to have a procedure to reduce the edema pressure in my lungs, which is causing me extreme shortness of breath to the point of passing out after minimal activity or even just talking for two minutes. And then Gonzalo's father wrote to Alex Rubenstein, our colleague. He said, I cannot accept the way my son has died. He was tortured, extorted, incommunicado for eight months and 11 days. And the U.S. Embassy did nothing to help my son. The responsibility of this tragedy is the dictator Zelensky with the concurrence of a senile American president, Joe Biden. Uh, and that's from Gonzalo's father. And just for background, for people, in case you're not familiar, Gonzalo Lira is an American citizen who was living in Ukraine uh, prior to the Russian invasion, very critical of the Ukrainian government. Uh, he found himself being under house arrest for basically uh, being critical of the Ukrainian government. Uh, and that escalated. There's a whole series of, of events. Max, you might know more of the details than I do, but the last major public incident we saw was that Gonzalo Lyric was, Lyric after uh, being detained, claimed he was going to try to leave Ukraine and flee. I believe he was trying to cross the border into Hungary. That didn't work. He was apprehended. Uh, and that's pretty much the last we heard of him uh, publicly uh, until now uh, with the announcement of his passing. Well, it was clear or it, you know, it, it's been very hard to get concrete information about what's happening. It was clear that the Ukrainian state was hunting him for his public statements, uh, where more than anyone in English inside Ukraine, he was living in Kharkiv. He was just lacerating the Ukrainian military and condemning the NATO proxy war, which, uh, you know, I suspect there are a lot of people in even Western Ukraine who quietly agree with him, given the state of the war and how many people are just being sent into the meat grinder right now for no reason. Um, and he was jailed for his opinions, where you have today Zelensky declaring that global freedom depends on Biden arming Ukraine. What freedom do people have in Ukraine? I mean, what freedom did Gonzalo Lira have? It was his, for his speech that he was essentially killed. He was denied. He needed medical care. He was denied it. And the other point here is Gray's own contributor, Liam Cosgrove, went to the State Department, I think repeatedly, to ask them what they were doing to intervene on behalf of Gonzalo Lira. And Matthew Miller told him, you know, this is a private case and 
we're not able to discuss it. We're not able to say anything. So they didn't say anything on his behalf publicly. I don't know what they did privately, but it looks like nothing. Nothing. Yeah. Look, there's so much that's very weird about this case, the complete inaction by the Biden administration. Um, I never quite understood. I just have to be honest here. I never quite understood Gonzalo, where he was coming from, why he was in Ukraine, um, how, you know, it was strange to me that he was so openly critical of the government, um, given what they do to, to dissidents, you know, given their open attempts to silence dissidents around the world, you know, like, uh, for example, putting people on, on kill lists. Um, and look, he had views that I found really objectionable. He was a diehard supporter of the dictator of Chile, Pinochet, um, and other things that I, I just, you know, that didn't sit well with me. But of course, uh, what happened to him, whatever the details are, you know, underlying all this, it's, it's, a, it's horrible. Uh, and it doesn't make any sense. And the first people who should be answering for this are... It, is the Biden administration to explain what they did to try to get an American citizen freed from uh, a client state's dungeons and how yeah, they I mean, let him die uh, from medical neglect? Yeah, I mean, I think the important point is if he died of medical neglect in a Ukrainian prison, which he was where he was jailed for his speech, he is no less, none of his opinions that would you know be out of the progressive mainstream about Pinochet or anything he said as coach red pill, make him any less of a dissident and political prisoner than anyone else anywhere in the world. And his death exposes the complete hypocrisy of the U S on Ukraine. Uh, this is supposed to be about defending democracy Yeah, and his, you know, to the extent that he was speaking out against this war and the Ukrainian military campaign from within Ukraine, he was as, he was brave, um, and I you know I appreciated his commentary on the war. I learned a lot from his commentary on what was happening inside Ukraine. There are a lot of details that I don't know, and we need to learn more. And it's amazing that Tucker Carlson is the only person with real reach and national media reach who's talking about this. Who hosted his father? Where's the New York Times or the Washington Post to get to, to the bottom of this? I mean, just from a purely journalistic point of view, this is an incredibly compelling and disturbing tragedy uh, that any journalist should want to cover. Yeah, uh, and really, and like, speak, speaking of which, all, yeah. Well, just speaking of which, looking at the U.S., looking at like uh, like Google News right now, no mainstream coverage at all of his death, even though it was announced you know, at least six or seven hours ago as we're recording this. But so far, no one in the mainstream has picked this up. An American dying inside uh, a Ukrainian prison, in, inside a Ukrainian hospital while under custody. That's a huge story. If it was an American dying in Russia, this would be, you know, front page news. Silence, radio silence so far when it comes to his death. And, and it was Sarah Ashton Cirillo who claimed credit for getting Gonzalo jailed. Am I right? So I, be I believe so. Yeah. So this former Democratic Party activist from Nevada who was named Michael Cirillo, who then transitioned to Sarah Ashton Cirillo, uh, began identifying as a woman and then uh, began hanging out with the neo-Nazi Azov Battalion in Ukraine, then gained an, as a supposed journalist, then gained a position within the Ukrainian military as the spokesperson for the national guard and issued these bizarre diatribes vowing to kill anyone who would uh you know challenge the ukrainian regime they claimed credit for getting gonzalo lira jailed uh and this is another just completely bizarre aspect to the story because look where sarah ashton cirillo is now and it looks like they're i mean it looks like they're detransitioning too. I'm now at the southern border of Tijuana. It is time to share some mind-numbing migration numbers, and we'll discuss the business of migration and how that hurts Ukraine and Taiwan. Like, hey everyone, I am in Tijuana, Mexico. As you know, I was in uh, Darien so, Province, the Darien Gap, uh, just a couple of days ago in Panama. I'm on leave. This character is no longer seeking to affect a uh, female, a, a female appearance or, uh, you know, 
typical, stereotypical female forms of behavior. And they're in Tijuana at the border and uh, howling about illegal migration to the US, kind of taking a conservative line there. I don't know what happened there. They're definitely out of a job within the Ukrainian military, which says a lot about the Ukrainian government that they would hire such a character. And this is the person who took responsibility for getting Gonzalo jailed, as far as I know. It's just so bizarre. Uh, so bizarre. And uh, anyway, I mean, Gonzalo Lira's father reached out to us several months ago and was just... Uh, said no one had helped him no there was there's no one to go to except alternative independent media so he's going to us we did a piece about it by alex rubenstein that um in which he talked about his son and how he and his son were estranged they hadn't spoken for decades um but that he couldn't take seeing his son being tortured to death in prison and his worst fears have been realized. And now he, you know, it, we have a piece up by Alex right now at our site. And Gonzalo Lira Sr. is pointing the finger squarely at the United States and the UK, the two top sponsors of this Ukrainian regime. Uh, fighting for global freedom by crushing anyone who criticizes it. So RIP Gonzalo Lira. Uh, this should be this should be a, a, a scandal covered by all, any media covering Ukraine. Yeah. Um, and again, nothing so far. So we're recording this. Absolutely nothing. It's such. It's so bizarre. Well, anyway, I'm I'm a. Uh, I think we'll continue covering it. And, you know, since we are in touch with Gonzalo's father, we'll get information from him and report it as soon as we get it. Absolutely. Well, um, thank you to everybody who uh, tuned in with us live. Uh, and thanks if you're watching this afterwards. It's great to have you with us. Uh, please support the Gray Zone. The link is there below on the screen. Thank you to everybody who sent us super chats. We really appreciate it. And the people we work in Ga with in Gaza appreciate it too because uh, that's who we support. And uh, yeah, Ma um, Max, anything else you want to say? Uh, well, thanks again to Joshua Valadores and uh, for the super chat. And thanks again to I am, I am I and I. Please read If I Must Die you must live. And that's a poem by Rifat Alarir. Your wish is my command. Uh, if I can find it. Thank you, Herzl, uh, for the message and the super chat. Um, yeah, thanks to everybody. Uh, this was... Uh, and I'll bring my kite. I'll bring my kite to the rally tomorrow if I can find it down here. If I must die, you must live to tell my story, to sell my things, to buy a piece of cloth and some strings, make it white with a long tail, so that a child somewhere in Gaza, while looking heaven in the eye, awaiting his dad who left in a blaze, and bid no one farewell, not even to his flesh, not even to himself, sees the kite, my kite you made, flying up above, and thinks for a moment an angel is there, bringing back love. Bring, if I must die, let it bring hope. Let it be a story. Rifat Alarir, RIP. Uh, and, uh, you know, if you're coming to DC tomorrow, I hope to see you there. Peace. Peace, everybody.